Hello once again AP Calculus BC students, Mr. Record here and we are beginning our discussion on the arc length which is one of the first truly BC topics in advanced placement calculus and before we begin our little discussion here I'd like to kind of reminisce about some things from the good old days of calculus AB, things that you would have seen um, you know, that would be uh, pertaining to the AB exam that dealt with the definite integrations applications. And one of those first things would be to be finding the area between two curves. So in the first picture, as you can see, I've got a red curve. Uh, in this case, that uh, would be characterized by the function y equal natural log of x. And then I have a blue curve that goes by the name of y equal x squared minus 3. And if we were to... Um, take a look at these two particular graphs and say, hey, I want to find the area between the two, the first thing that we would have to concern ourselves with uh, would be certainly to find the um, points of intersection. And those two points of intersection um, are not pretty in this particular case. Uh, they look like they might be, say, perhaps 0 and 2, but, but they're not. And a graphing calculator would, would certainly reveal those particular values to you. And, and then you would uh, be able to um, piece together your integration and we always recall that uh, the mantra in our class was to take the topmost curve which in this case is the red one and subtract from it the blue or the bottom most curve and in this particular instance as you can tell you're going to have to use a graphing calculator in order to come up with that particular result well if you remember the application extended itself into three dimensions somewhat if you were trying to find the volume of a solid of revolution, uh, whether you're using a disk method or a washer method. And I don't think I'm going to be quite as thorough with these two particular examples, but um, you can see that we, we still uh, retain the same um, sort of top minus bottom idea, the top being the curve 2 minus x squared and the bottom being the line y equal 1. But notice all of that will get squared because that whole thing serves as sort of a radius, if you will. And we have our good old pi radius squared idea multiplied by a thickness or a height, which is in essence giving us the volume of this cylindrical slice. And of course, integration just simply allows us to stack many of those slices on top of each other, side by side, uh, over a certain interval, in this case, negative 1 to 1, to come up with our particular volume. So it's just really pi r squared h um, in its calculus manifestation. Um, the washer method works again very similarly but the the um the format is slightly different as you have an outermost radius capital r and an innermost radius cap a small lowercase r that would have to be squared individually and then subtracted in order to uh, go about finding your particular volume so where do we go from here well arc length is our next topic and in this section you know we're, we're going to use integration to find the arc length the surface area eventually in later videos but what we're going to do in either case is we're going to rely on a very familiar friend and that friend would be your distance formula and um, I also go into a little bit of uh, of a discussion about what a rectifiable curve is and that's just simply a curve that does have this finite arc length it, it's something that you're certainly capable of finding, you know, from, from beginning to end, the, how, how, how long that particular uh, curve is going to be. So, um, and we say that a function would be continuously differentiable on the interval and, and that its graph would be smooth. And those are ideas that sort of permeate through uh, calculus BC quite a bit. But for right now, the, the thing that I really want you to focus on is how this guy is going to be employed. So, what I've got here is a particular function, and uh, what I'm going to do is sort of highlight uh, this particular function a little bit in yellow from beginning to end to kind of indicate that, yes, this is what I'm trying to find the length of. Picture if I could somehow hold a piece of string that would basically emulate that yellow path, and I want to figure out how long that string would be. Well, the way that we're going to go about doing this is basically to, to kind of zoom in quite a bit on this 
curve that's so difficult to find the length of and, and break it into smaller pieces. And I can use some multicoloring to do that. Maybe I might be interested in finding that red piece followed by that green piece followed by this blue piece perhaps and then maybe a purple piece afterwards. Well, it may not look at that any one of these individual colored pieces is a straight line and I would say that no they're not. But we could further subdivide so that would be the case. Now I don't want to do that for the sake of the picture getting to a point where it would be very hard to interpret. But I want you to use your imagination just, just for a moment and just suppose, just pretend that this red piece right here perhaps was a straight line. It was the straight line between the two ordered pairs x o y o and x one y one, we we certainly would have no trouble finding the distance between those particular points because we would just use our distance formula. Well, if if that's going to be the case, then it seems like well what we've got is just several of those potentially straight line distances, right? That we just simply need to add together. And how would we add these together? Well, we would use our good old friend, the definite interval. So basically, you know, by setting up the, 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 the statement that uh, any delta x sub i, which is just simply the difference between any two consecutive x values, in this case, arbitrarily, I'll say x sub i minus x sub i minus 1. Now, I know a lot of students, if you're like me when I was younger and I was studying this, I was like, well, what is this i business? I wouldn't worry so much about it. I think you really ought to latch on to what I had said previously. These particular x values are just two consecutive x values. It might be the x value with that point and the x value with the second point. Subtract the two, and you basically have a delta x coming out of that. Why all the subscript? Well, we just don't really know how many of these partitions that we're going to have. So we just arbitrarily call them i and then i plus 1 and i plus 2, etc., etc. That's all there is to it. So we can then go about showing what the length um, uh, of this curve, the approximation, would be by doing the following. Well, think about this. What we've got here is simply the distance formula, right? The square root of the sum of the difference of the squares. And then we're going to add up every single one of these colored shapes, right? And we'll do that all the way from uh, i equal 1 to i equal n. Well, that's going to segue into just a, a, a much simpler notation because we said that the difference between these two consecutive x's would just be a delta x of i as well as the difference between two consecutive y's. And then we move to a very unusual step. I'm going to slide this over to kind of cover up our grand finale here. And I know that does give away some of where we're going with this, but that's just fine. I want to explain this step a little bit because this is the one that students kind of get lost on a little bit. Basically, all we're doing in this particular instance is multiplying by 1. Now, how is that happening? How does that work? Very simple. What we're doing is we are taking the value square root, I'm sorry, the value delta x of i squared and dividing it by itself. Notice that that particular quotient is still underneath the contents of the square root. So we just really are multiplying by the number 1. Well, why would we do such a thing like that? Well, simply put, we can do some really interesting simplifying with it. By that, I mean if you were to look at the result of dividing those particular values, you're going to see that that will result in this 1. And then if we divide these values by each other, and I understand that I am getting a little dark down here with my color it's overlapping, but we would see that we would just get delta yi squared over delta xi squared, which is exactly what we've got written here, uh, albeit in a quantity with our square around it. And then you'll notice that this delta xi squared that was underneath the square root ends up moving outside of the square root 
dropping its square because the square root and the square essentially cancel out. And technically, you can argue and say, well, no, 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 that's really an absolute value. But since delta x has to be a positive amount because it's a it's a difference between two x's, um, we don't uh, really think about the absolute values as being required. So. Here's where we're at. Well, I don't see any calculus involved, right? I see the summation. Well, that's what's going to sort of open the door for the definite integral to take over. And as n approaches infinity, now remember, n is just simply going to be the number of these little teeny tiny line segments that we're going to throw in through our curve. We can find that the, um, the uh, limit will place itself in front of the summation. And from earlier discussions in calculus, we know that that ultimately results in an integration expression with the boundaries. Um, in this case, I'm just going to, instead of using x0 and xn, which I certainly could have, I just decided to use uh, more friendly lurking values like a and b, but they do mean the same thing. And furthermore, I did a couple of other things here. As you can tell, I decided that, oh, the delta y over delta x would be much, much better written as just the uh, derivative of the function f, because that's really what we've got here. We, we've got you know, the idea of, of slope being the same as the derivative in this particular instance. And um, our delta x notation can, can change to the differential notation dx. And this becomes the, the formula, ultimately, that you will use for uh, all of your arc length problems. So in future videos here, I'm going to show you some concrete examples, but this at least gives you an idea about where this very vastly important formula for arc length comes from. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.